Good evening and welcome everyone uh, to a program that I'm sure is going to provoke some interesting and lively discussion. As many of you know, over the last couple of decades, Gettysburg College has engaged in a series of discussions and votes regarding course credit for military science courses taken by our students who are participating in Dickinson's ROTC program. Course credit had not been allowed by our faculty due to the military's discriminatory policy based on sexual orientation. Last spring, after the military lifted its don't ask, don't tell policy, the conversation about course credit began again. However, some of you will remember right here in this room, the debate came to a standstill when it became clear that the US military continues to discriminate against transgendered and transsexual individuals. It was at that point that our students came together and crafted a motion for our faculty to consider, a compromise that would allow our students to get credit for these courses. Right here in this room, this motion was passed in a moment that I think demonstrated great inclusion. And for many of us, I have to say it also elicited great emotion. Included in the motion was a commitment to provide formalized opportunities to discuss and debate discriminatory policies that exclude transgendered and transsexual people from serving openly in the military. This year, we have as a campus had a great deal of discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And tonight, we follow up on our pledge to provide formal opportunities for discussion and debate about those policies that keep transgendered and transsexual individuals from serving in the military. And we are very proud as a campus to provide a platform for this important dialogue. I want to thank those students who are participating in ROTC and those who are members of allies who've led our college's discussion of this issue. I also want to thank the Eisenhower Institute for sponsoring this presentation and all of those individuals who helped to organize tonight's event, especially Rim Babatwanis, Mike Wedlock, Jeffrey Blavitt, Rick Farwell, Jack Ryan, David Wemmer, and most especially General Bill Matz and Aaron Duran. And of course, a special thank you to our panelists who I know are going to provide us with a rich context for our thinking and discussion. And now I'd like to introduce two students who've helped to lead the conversations on campus, ROTC Cadet Ben Flanders and Allies President Adrian Ellis. Welcome, everybody. So I'm Adrienne Ellis, the Allies President here at Gettysburg, and I'm truly honored to be here tonight with Ben and with everybody who worked hard to bring this discussion together and to introduce an event that I've been looking to forward to for over a year. Um, last spring, when a debate over whether ROTC credit should be given to students at Gettysburg, a truly unique conversation between the ROTC students and Allies Club members and advisors arose. It truly morphed into a wonderful situation of two groups of people coming together to reach a common ground in a way that they never have before. A respectful discourse was followed and insightful and eye-opening discussions were had. Everyone who was part of the multiple dialogues learned something new, whether it was about military policy or trans rights. I believe that we all grew as people and as an institution and exemplified the reason we attend or work at a liberal arts college. We want to welcome all of the speakers tonight who traveled from various parts of the United States and Canada. We thank you for being here and continuing our journey of delving into a topic that is important to talk about despite its lack of representation in the media. Wow, Adrian, I could not agree more. Uh, my name is Ben Flanders. I'm the uh, commander of the Gettysburg uh, Detachment ROTC. Um, I just want to firstly agree with you and secondly welcome everyone who's here on behalf of Gettysburg ROTC. Jim Stuffel, Liz Berriman, you guys are up there. And uh, also I want to thank um, Paul Rule, who was part of this conversation, although you never hear his name. Um, I just want to touch a little bit on kind of my, my journey you know, as sort of an introduction to this. You know, I, I graduated from a conservative Christian high school in northwestern Pennsylvania, and I never would have thought that I would have heard of these, these terms. And, and uh, actually, right up to the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I had no idea about any of these things with a heavy heart. I, I, admit it. Um, but since then, I've really learned a lot. And I think that just, just learning and communication are lessons, takeaways that we can take away from, from what we've already learned here. Uh, communication especially. Uh, if we just talk about these issues, who knows what, what we could you know, come up with. We, we 
started out as two organizations that didn't acknowledge each other on campus, and now I'm the CA for the uh, the Allies House, and we're very close, and it's it's an amazing atmosphere. Um, but that's that's all I really have at this time. I wanted to introduce, if I could get everybody to stand up for just a moment of silence uh, for transgender individuals and the armed forces, veterans, and uh, those who are no longer with us. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce Ramvidas Baltituonis, an economics professor here at Gettysburg and one of the faculty advisors for Allies, who really just put this whole thing together. So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Adrian and Ben. Um, uh, I would like to welcome as well everyone who is uh, present here today um, to see this panel and participate in the discussion. I'm also welcoming those who are tuning in um, to watch this through live stream. Um, I would like to let everyone know that you can submit questions through Twitter if you are watching us online. Um, you can tweet it with hashtag EIPanel or at EIGBC. And, um, I will be watching tweets as they come in and we'll introduce some of those questions uh, to the panel discussion. Um, we also have index cards that Ben and Adrian um, have, so if you are not on Twitter yet um, and you are here, you can use the index cards, just wave to them and they will uh, bring the index cards uh, to you and write your questions and uh, they will bring those questions to me as well. So. Um, in the spirit that students came together last year, we would like to start this conversation today as well, because probably one of the most important qu lessons that we learned that once we start talking and having a conversation, a lot of the imaginary barriers that we have, they fall. And it's important that we hear all perspectives. We might disagree, um, but if we do not talk, then we will disagree on everything that we think we disagree. So. I would like to introduce our um, great panelists today that um, agreed to join this discussion. And I will introduce them in the sequence that they will be um, speaking. Um, so first we will have Mara Kiesling. Um, Mara Kiesling is the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, she has worked quite extensively on a lot of health access um, uh, NGO organizations and she will be contributing to the panel today. Then we'll have Monica Helms, um, who is the founder and the president of Transgender American Veterans Association. And uh, Monica served on two submarines in the Navy uh, from 1970 to 1978. And um, another interesting fact uh, about Monica is that she is the creator of the transgender pride flag, um, uh, which transgender community uses since 1999. Um, we are welcoming uh, Commander David Wilcox uh, to the panel as well. Um, Commander Wilcox uh, serves as the Health Services Attaché at Canadian Embassy. Um, and um, he was first commissioned in the Canadian Armed Forces. And we are very happy to have you um, here on the panel today. And last but not least, we have um, Dr. Chris Shoemaker. He's a senior vice president of SIVA, an international consulting and management firm specializing in institutional capacity building, conflict resolution, and strategic planning. Um, Dr. Shoemaker is a retired colonel. colonel. Um, he served in the US Army for nearly 25 years and will be bringing his perspectives um, to this important conversation and dialogue as well. So without further ado, I would like to give about five minutes to each um, um, participant um, at the panel to bring your perspective, to, to give us your perspective with which you come to this, to this discussion um, on, on this particular issue. And you, each of you have a microphone, so you can turn it on uh, when you're ready to speak. Um, and then we'll go from there. And just as a rem reminder, you can tweet your questions at, with hashtag EIPanel. Okay, so Mara, the word is yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me here. I, I thank the college and the institute and um, allies. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm Mara Kiesling, and I'm the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Uh, I should probably note I'm the only panelist without military service, I believe, and thank you all for your service. Um, I come to this as an activist, primarily. Um, uh, I guess by way of just a little background, so we're on the same page, transgender people still cannot serve in the military. Um, there are various exclusions that, that keep us out. There are medical exclusions, uh, uh, medical disqualifications, there are mental health disqualifications, and then trans people sometimes also run afoul of other kinds of things like conduct unbecoming, um, uh, accessing civilian health care without authorization and things like that. Um, and I should say also that by transgender people, Ultimately, when this becomes a national issue that we're talking about, we're going to be talking about lots of different kinds of transgender people. More and more, we're seeing folks who are suddenly 17, 18, 19 years old, and they transi transitioned um, from one gender to another when they were five years old or six years old, and they had hormone blockers, and maybe they've already had surgery. That's going to be one kind of trans person. They're going to be people like me who transitioned in, in adulthood. They're going to be people who are in the military and come out as transgender. And uh, I, I just wanted to say that so that we remember that's just a, a confounding little uh, something that has to be taken into account. So I come to this really simply this way. Trans people already serve. Um, it's discriminatory that they can't serve openly. It is unsafe that they can't serve openly. Um, it is not good for military readiness that they cannot serve openly. Um, there are veterans who are hurt because there is not open, um, open service. And last but not least, we're going to win. Trans people will be able to serve openly at some point. I wouldn't want to guess whether it'll be in three years or 30 years. Uh, but I will tell you, it won't be in 30 years. It, it'll be before that. And I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to do it like they have in other countries. Um, but backing up onto some of these arguments, we're, we're at the end of my four minutes, probably? Oh, put the microphone closer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my organization, along with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, conducted a survey of 6,500 trans people, and we found that um, about 20% of the adult trans population in the country has served in the military at some point. Um, there have been other studies, and there's a couple coming out shortly that will show that also. What that means, it's really important, is that trans people are twice as likely as other people in the general population to join the military. And there's been lots of, um, uh, lots of interesting speculation about why that is and some really interesting studies. Uh, about people fleeing to hypermasculinity. One of the most interesting things is there seems to be a tendency for trans women, that is folks like me who, who have or want to transition from male to female, to have at some point in their life tried to prove hypermasculinity by joining the military. At the same time, there's a tendency for trans men, that is people who have, tra who have or want to transition from female to male, to join the military in order to flee to hypermasculinity. Um, I think that's an interesting thing that we don't know enough about yet, but we're going to see more. Uh, we're going to see more and more studies about that. But there are lots of trans people in the military. We're twice as likely to serve, according to all of the best numbers that anybody has. And um, uh, more and more, we are getting calls out serve uh, SLDN, which is the the premier LGBT um, military service organization, is getting calls from trans people who want to come out or think they should have been able to come out now that Don't Ask, Don't Tell has been repealed. Um, there's a real, a, a real serious problem we're seeing is trans people not being able to access um, help, not being able to talk to helping professionals because if they out themselves to helping professionals, they can get outed and then outed. Um, uh, that, is, uh, that is unsafe for those um, folks, obviously. And then I, I just want to talk about veterans, and I, I'm sorry I'm cramming a lot here into my four minutes, um, but I, I just wanted to kind of stipulate some of these things, and I, I don't know if everything will be agreeable to my colleagues here, but um, we also have seen that, you know, veterans, we're overrepresented as veterans, which makes sense. If we're twice as likely to serve, we're twice as likely to be veterans. And we have had 
at least until recently, a real problem in a lot of, in a lot of the VA system with trans people being treated respectfully uh, or being treated at all. Uh, in 2010, um, Secretary Shinseki issued a directive asking all VA facilities to treat trans people appropriately, um, fairly, and the same way they treat other veterans. Um, but, but part of why trans veterans have a rough time accessing services is because they're not seen as real people who should have been in the military. There's not a tradition of transgender people being in the military, so it's hard for there to seem to be a tradition to have trans people as veterans. Uh, that's unfair to people who have served our country. And I just shoved a lot of stuff there into a couple minutes. So I'm going to pass the microphone over to Commander Wilcox or back to you. Yay. Oh, to Monica. Thank you. Hello, my name is Monica Helms, and I, I too would like to thank everybody that has made this possible. This is a wonderful discussion, and, and at a, a university that has uh, proven itself to be on top of what is going on in the world in this this particular area and I and I thank you for for that um, I served in, from 1970 to 1978 uh, I joined not because I was trying to get into hyper masculinity I joined because my my draft number was low <laughs> so I figured I would go in the Navy because uh, and, and volunteer for submarines because they weren't shooting submarines down over Vietnam, so I figured I'd be safe, and I was. But uh, I would like to add a couple of things to what Mara said. Uh, w uh, the Transgender American Veterans Association also did a survey back in uh, 2000. What was it? 2000? Oh, yeah, 2008. And in our survey, we asked what kind of discharge that uh, people had. 827 uh, transgender veterans took our survey, and 85% of them had honorable discharges. So that means that not only do we, there's more of us who serve, higher percentage in our, our community, but that we, get, we serve honorably, and we do what the military wants us to do. And, and recently, as, as you probably all know, the Department of Defense uh, lifted the barrier for women to do anything in the military. So that means that all the jobs in the military are now gender neutral, which means that they don't conform to any one particular gen gender. So my feeling is, if these jobs are gender non-conforming in a way, then why can't gender non-conforming people do them? It doesn't make sense. Uh, we. We've seen many people over the years. I've done a I've done a uh, investigation, and there have been gender nonconforming individuals who served all the way back to the Revolutionary War. And there is one gender nonconforming individual in that graveyard over there, just to, just across the street, an individual, a Confederate soldier woman who, who uh, was a man in, this, in their uh, army was buried with all the other Confederate soldiers, but they didn't find out that uh, this person was female until after uh, they found her. And they didn't, they didn't have a name because they didn't, apparently did not uh, put the names of all the Confederate soldiers. But there is one individual within walking distance, essentially, from here that also served. Uh, 400, there's, they say there's about 400 uh, documented, uh, um, that, excuse me, 400 documentation of, of uh, women who served as men in the, just the Civil War alone. So we have served all the time in every war. For, and the very first well-known transsexual Christine Jorgensen served in World War II. Uh, we've had people, an individual that both Mar and I know, who served as a, uh, as a colonel in, in the Army, and she uh, served as a, a terrorist uh, threat uh, program that, that, that uh, went and hunted, hunted out terrorists. And she had a special program, and uh, she even had to report to the vice president. 
and and this individual is is uh, has served honorably in the in the military. So we have many examples of individuals who have served honorably. Who are there are many who are serving today, but we can't tell you about them because then we don't want them to lose their job. Uh, so we want want to emphasize the fact that this is not something that is new. This is something that people don't know about that they should have known about for years. And if we have done this job and we've done it honorably, then why can't we do it openly? Why can't we do it like the Canadians do it and the British? Speaking of the British, all of you know who Prince William is, I'm sure. He's a... <laughs> uh, not yet. We don't know. I think his wife will have something to say about that. But anyway, Prince William is a pilot for a rescue helicopter. One of the members on his crew is a male to female transsexual and who was at his wedding. How many in this room were at the wedding of Prince William? Not seeing any hands. So if this is an individual who is second in line to be king of England, serving right alongside a, a uh, male to female transsexual. Now, what the heck is wrong with the American military? You know, are you scared that something's going to happen? Apparently not. Canadians sure are not. So, I, I just think that there needs to be some rethinking in this. And uh, so, I will turn it over to the next speaker. At, um, Commander Wilcox, um, Health Services Attaché from the Canadian Embassy, and I have to apologize because I have a short presentation. With your indulgence, then I will... Uh Uh, again, so I, I'm uh, the health service attache from the Canadian Embassy, Washington, D.C., and I'm here just to talk to you about uh, our transgender policy. This is just a small, uh, this is a, a brief chronology of events, and I, I wanted to present this because we didn't have it perfect. Uh, in fact, we had a very regressive program before the repatriation of our Constitution, so before 78, we were not allowed to recruit transgenders or LGBTs. They uh, were not allowed to serve, and if they were in the military, uh, they were found and asked to leave. Um, we, in 1978, the Parliament passed the Canadian Human Rights Act, and in 1982, we passed the Constitution Act of 1982, which contains our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And you may not realize this, but we're actually a very young country, because prior to that, Britain owned our constitution, so we really only became a, a full country with our own constitution in 1982. But the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was very important to us. Uh, there were a lot of challenges, and in 1988, we changed our policy to a don't ask, don't tell type policy. They could still serve, but their career was frozen. They weren't asked to leave, but they couldn't get any, uh, they couldn't advance. Now, our Chief of Defense Staff, jo General John uh, de Chastelaine, was actually very progressive. And in 91, he actually went to the government and said, this is unlawful, we would like to change it. But unfortunately, the government at the time um, wouldn't, didn't follow his recommendation and uh, they, the policy wasn't changed. There was a significant challenge in 92. Michelle Douglas, a lesbian, was asked to leave. She challenged that. And um, the same year, recognizing the way the court decision was going to go, we got rid of a very regressive policy, and you can tell it's regressive just by the naming of it. Uh, it was CFAO 1920 Homosexuality Sexual Abnormality Investigation Medical Examination. So just from the title, you can tell how regressive it was. This was replace, replaced by a uh, new policy that just talked about sexual misconduct, not, not picking any individual group, but what was considered sexual misconduct. So our policy progressed until we actually codified our harassment policies in uh, DAOD uh, 5012. And then finally, with uh, working the policy again, we finally ended up with a Canford Gen that I'm going to describe uh, in a second in 2012. But before I do that, I just want to talk to you a little bit about um, 
some of the dangers in doing surveys and uh, but uh, as background then since uh, 1992 lesbian gays bisexuals and I should put transgenders LBGTs could uh, openly serve in our military one of the dangers of doing surveys is that in 1985, we surveyed 6,500 male soldiers, and 62% said that they would refuse to shower, undress, sleep in the same room as a gay soldier. Uh, fortunately, we persevered, and uh, we pushed the program ahead. And every study since then has showed that once the ban was lifted, uh, there was no increase in disciplinary problems, performance, recruitment, sexual misconduct, or resignation. Nobody resigned because of this policy. In fact, there was a very comprehensive academic study, and I'd highly recommend that you Google this. You can get the whole copy in a PDF format, but this was a US study on the effects of the 1992 lifting of the restrictions on gay and lesbian service in the Canadian forces appraising the evidence. And again, uh, they found that th there was no change in military performance, unit cohesion, or discipline. And interestingly, um, the percent of military women who experienced sexual harassment, heterosexual women, decreased by 46% with the introduction of that policy. So I just want to point out that there's the danger, 20% of the population will embrace change. 40% can be convinced that it's good. Another 40% will never accept change. So um, it's, there is a danger in deriving your policy from surveys. These are our policies, so um, these are our latest policies, and these were specifically for transgenders. What we did since 1982, so, or 1992, so we allowed LGBTs to serve in the military since 1992, but we, it was an, done on an individual basis, especially, uh, especially the uh, sexual reassignment surgeries, which we fund. Uh, so we had a policy written in uh, 2010, which was ma mainly a checklist, uh, it was found to be unsatisfactory because it didn't provide an explanation, so there was another policy written in 2011, and then that resulted in the checklist on the left having to be rewritten. So this culminated in uh, February of 2012. So I don't want you to think that we didn't have uh, a policy. We did, but this was the culmination. Like Once we codified everything, we came up with this. And so it says that those two, those two other policies that I presented were law, and that the very bottom paragraph says that the CF are committed to the principles of equality of all people and the dignity and worth of each of them. The Canadian Forces transsexual members are a valued and integral part of the Canadian Forces, and they have the same right as any other person to work in a harassment-free workplace. So can for Gen, that is sent out to every single member of the Armed Forces. So it's, uh, it was sort of the culmination of uh, years of work. One of the things that I just wanted to mention quickly that was a huge benefit to us, medical, which I'm part of, used to own what was the spec called the spectrum of care. That was a, um, a policy that described all the medical benefits and services that each member was uh, entitled to. What we cleverly did was give that to the environmental commanders. So we gave it to the command structure, and we had established the five pillars, but when they took ownership of that, they actually then had to deal with the moral issues. But if you look at those five principles, gender reassignment surgery meets all of them. It maintains the health and mental well-being. It re restores serving members to operational effectiveness. It adheres to evidence-based medicine. The benefit is not purely experimental research or cosmetic because we consider um, uh, sex reassignment to be uh, a functional or a, um, a structural procedure, not cosmetic. And the benefits are included in other provinces. Now what we do, uh, so uh, in summary, this is my last slide, and uh, so we allow all LGBTs to serve. We also pay for all of their uh, sex reassignment surgeries. Uh, because we don't have that expertise in uniform, we utilize two centers of excellence, one in Ontario and one in Quebec. In fact, most of them go to uh, Quebec, but we pay for their transport, their accommodation, the procedures, and, um, and in summary, oh, I should say that uh, 
we, we also use international guidelines. So we use the uh, World Professional Association of Transgender Health as a standard of care, and a lot of the provinces provide additional support in publications that we can utilize. And uh, that's it, and uh, I guess I will have one more speaker, and then we can open up to questions. And thank you for your indulgence. Uh, Yeah, how about those redskins, anyway? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm at the tail end here of, of uh, this excellent series of presentations, uh, and I'm going to present uh, a slightly different perspective. And I'd emphasize the word perspective because I don't think any of us would disagree that uh, the transgender issue is a fundamental issue of human rights. Uh, to become what you believe you should become is essential element to the pursuit of happiness, which is the foundation of, of, um, of our society. But there are segments, very few segments in our society that don't operate under that principle. And one of those segments is the U.S. military. In America, we have founded all of our traditions on the rights of the individual, individual pursuit of happiness, individual pursuit of wealth, individual pursuit of well-being, of education, of spiritual fulfillment. But in the military, the rights of the individual are seconded to and subsumed by the rights of the collective. Now, this sounds Marxist or Leninist, and there are a good deal of socialist elements in the way the military is constituted. But the military alone functions as a collective organization. And when men and women join the military, they voluntarily give up many of the rights that most of us, including me now in civilian life, I'm discovering to my joy, um, have as part of our tradition. Um, freedom of speech, largely denied in the military. Freedom of assembly. Uh, freedom of certain types of association. Other things that are, that are, again, part and parcel of the American experience. The right to form a union. The right to quit a job. Um, the right to walk up to your boss and say, I'm not going to do that because that's not what I believe in. Those are all basic rights that we enjoy as citizens that soldiers, and I'll use the term soldiers now generically to apply to soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and anybody else, Boy Scouts, whatever, um, that soldiers voluntarily give up in order to serve the nation. So any change in, in policy must first be looked at through the lens of what is, what is right for the collective. And that's a much harder uh, subject to get at. And uh, uh, Commander's exactly right. The dangers of, of allowing uh, policy by polls uh, is is true in any aspect of, of uh, policy development, but certainly true when it applies to a collective organization that has um, almost an anthropomorphic existence in and of itself. Now, it's, it's tempting to say, and I, 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 I'm one that's always been tempted to say, well, if it's good for the Canadians, or it's good for the Brits, or it's good for the French, well, forget the French, it's good for, then it must be okay for the Americans. Um, and in, in many ways, that's true. But the mission of the American military, especially in the 21st century, especially in these first two decades, is different than the missions of other militaries. Um, the mission of the U.S. military is to fight and win the wars of our nation. Now, we have a lot of other things that we do, and we do them very well. But our responsibility as soldiers, as leaders in the military, is to fight the major cataclysmic events in human history that we've defined as warfare. And if that were not our mission, then we as taxpayers have been getting ripped off for a long time because we're buying aircraft carrier battle groups, we're buying nuclear submarines, we're buying intercontinental ballistic missiles, we're buying armor divisions and field artillery brigades 
not for peacekeeping responsibilities, not for humanitarian relief, but to fight and win the wars of our nation. So when we consider changes in, in policy, when we consider the impact of what admittedly is a relatively small population, it must be considered against this broader backdrop of what is good for the collective, what's good for the institution, and does that in any way impair our ability to fight and win the wars of our nation? And it, it's, it's a tough question. And I guess my, my plea to all those who are involved in the discussion is to consider multiple perspectives. And unique in American society, the perspective for, from the military is again that of the collective as opposed to the individual. And with that very popular note, I'll uh, turn it back to Rim. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to give an opportunity for panelists to respond to, to each other's um, comments that we just heard. And um, if you could also elaborate, so what are the obstacles? What, what are, um, and and we, we might have different perspectives for transgender individuals to serve openly in the military. So whoever wants to go first. Well, could I respond to me first? Uh, because I said something I didn't like. Um, no, I, I, really, I would like to clarify something I said. When I was talking about the flight to masculinity, I, I certainly did not mean to imply that all trans people who go into the military are doing it for that reason. Um, most trans people join the military for the exact same reason everybody joins, or for the exact same reasons people join the military. Some do it because they want to serve. Some do it because, you know, for economic reasons. Some do it for family reasons. Some do it because they believe it. So I just wanted to be clear of that. Oh, sorry, I'll keep it near the thing there. So I, I wanted to clarify myself there. Monica? Yes, it was very interesting uh, what uh, the Colonel said. It's interesting because I heard this before. Gays and lesbians can't serve. You know, it's uh, we can't do this because of unit cohesion. We can't do this because of this. We can't do this because it's a tradition or whatever that, uh, however way they wanted to say it. And interesting enough, we've now been uh, oh, well over a year, a year and a half, and there hasn't been any issues about gays and lesbians and bisexual people in the military. And it's, so all the arguments as far as I could see, are a bit of a straw man arguments that it's, it doesn't seem to hold up. It doesn't hold up when they were saying the same things about women serving in the military. It doesn't hold up when they said the same things about gay, lesbian, bisexual serving in the military. It apparently didn't hold up when nine of our allied countries had gays and lesbians serving right next to us in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. It, didn't, it doesn't hold up because uh, nine of our allied countries now allow transgender people to serve openly, and they haven't had, none of those countries have had any issues. And, and to say that we're kind of different, well, we're different because we have a large military. But let me tell you, I'm, I'm a, an avid submarine person who uh, has done a lot of research about submariners in various parts of the world. And I'll tell you what, the British submariners are some of the toughest in the world. They are right up there with us. Their discipline, their efficiency, their policies, everything that they do is right along with us. So I really can't see that you know, when, when they fought next to us in Afghanistan, they fight or fight next to us in Iraq, they how that we could be better than them when we're they're watching our back just as much as we're watching theirs. If we didn't feel comfortable about working with them, then why did we? So if if all the arguments about well, you know, we're different you know, and, and uh, we can't, uh, you know, this is not something that we can, you know, work with. It's, it's just silly because I know it can be done. 
I'm sitting next to a person who their country has done it for, what, two decades, more than two decades now? It's like, gee, you know, the wheel has been invented and they've changed it a half a million times. Let's, let's put the wheel on our car for a while and see how we run with it. I'll try again. Um, I just wanted to point out two things about how we rolled out the program that might be informative. One was that we made no accommodations so that uh, we've had women in our frontline units for over 30 years and we don't accommodate them. I don't mean that in a negative sense, but uh, um, when I was in Iraq, uh, the bunk next to me was a female officer. On our ship, on our submarines, if you're a female submariner, we have female submariners. Uh, in the bunking area, you'll have a guy, woman, a guy. So th that re removes all jealousies and favoritism. The other is that we introduced a program called SHARP, and it was sensitivity training, not just for um, LGBTs. It was for all kinds of harassment, and that was an annual occurrence. So initially when we rolled out the program, it was just the policy and the understanding that this had full command support. After that, then we tried to change the hearts and minds. We created programs to look at uh, sensitivity training and understanding, and that program has been so successful that it stopped. It's, uh, it's just not an issue. It takes a minute to push out once you flip the switch. Aha. Uh -huh. um, from, from the grand issues that, that the United States military confronts, if tomorrow President Obama signed an executive order changing the rules, the U.S. military is not going to fall apart. I mean, we're, we're not going to see people, riots in the streets, and, and a military that is arguably one of the finest in our history is, is suddenly going to disintegrate. It's not going to happen. But we do need to take a look at this issue from the perspective of, of those that make the military work which are the soldiers. Um, we ask a lot, and the reason I, 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 if I sounded in any way disparaging of our Canadian allies or the Brits, again, forgot the French, um, I didn't mean to sound that, but it is a reality that we ask our soldiers to do a lot. Um, one of the problems that we have in, in the professional military that we have now, not having a draft, is we don't have a constant churn between civil society and the military. So the level of understanding of what it means to be a soldier in the ranks among the body politic is almost non-existent today. Uh, back in World War II, uh, um, certainly that didn't exist when you had that churn. When you had, a, a, even during the dregs of Vietnam, uh, when you had uh, people coming out of civil society, being forced in the military, and then going out again. Um, the body politic had a sense of what the military was like. That doesn't exist now. And, and the fact that we, we, have, we often frame this debate in, in similar terms, looking at, at, at importance from very different perspectives. From my perspective, as a, as a admittedly now an old soldier, maybe I'll just fade away, I don't know. Um, the soldier that is asked to do so much, he's asked to, to put up with all kinds of, of uh, discomfort, he's asked to go in harm's way, uh, he's asked to have repeated deployments into uh, combat zones, he's asked to be away from his family, he's asked to do all kinds of things, asked to go out and I don't know, how many have served in the army in Germany in the wintertime? Yeah, a couple. There's no more miserable place in the world than Grafenwehr Training Center in Germany. But our soldiers are out there on a, a Christmas Eve, and I'll, I'll dra uh, over-dramatize this, um, guarding nuclear stock positions. This is a, back during the Cold War. Um, miserably cold snowing, everything wrong that could possibly be going wrong, and the soldier's happy and upbeat, and I don't know why, because I want to get back in, in a warm area. Um, so we owe a lot to that soldier. And 
and we owe a lot to give him or her the maximum comfort we can give them in those opportunities where we can give them comfort. And the comfort levels that we can give them, those opportunities aren't very many. It's a warm place to sleep. It's a shower. Uh, it's a, a hot meal. Uh, it's a change of socks sometimes. And the soldiers out there know exactly what, what, how, how wonderful those things feel in some cases. So we have to look at this from the, the large number of individuals that make up the collective, because we owe them an awful lot. We owe them, quite frankly, more than we owe a, a, a potentially, um, and I emphasize potentially, segment of society that we would bring into the military that would cause a, a higher level of discomfort. And, and uh, 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 Monica's right. It's a tribute to both Americans and to the American soldier that there have been, there's been no collapse of good order and discipline and no major um, issues involving soldier on soldier kind of violence as a result of the, of the lifting of the uh, don't ask, don't tell policy, which incidentally uh, was not a DOD policy, it was a congressional policy. And it was changed when Congress changed the law. <coughs> um, but the, the cost to the individual soldier is unknown. So my plea once again is let's look at this thing from multiple perspectives because unlike any other institution in American society, this one is hard to crack and you need to, t to, uh, to handle it with delicacy, with professionalism, always oriented on what's good for the maximum number of soldiers that you can reach. Mara, I agree with you. At some point, th three years or 30 years, it's going to change. But let's, let's make sure we do it right. Yeah, I, I think you and I are probably uh, on a much closer page than everybody would imagine. Because I, I don't actually hear you saying... You're a Republican? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, let's go with that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying is, is be careful about it. And I, and I think... You know, the, the beauty of being, uh, one of the beauties of being a trans activist right now is that when we, we really do put evidence to things, we do put science to things, and when we put away old stereotypes, and, and I'm absolutely not, you've said nothing to indicate you have any bad old stereotypes, so I'm not talking about you in particular, but the discomfort that may be felt by uh, service members based on old stereotypes those are always going to lose out when science is applied, when real understanding is applied, and when we really do think things through. I, I, don't, I don't want to rashly just change the military um, for the heck of it, but there are just some things that are done because they've always been done that way. There's some things that have been done because of old misunderstandings and stereotypes, and, and sometimes those do need to get swept, uh, swept away. And what I would ask is that we also think that, w we also consider that maybe what we're doing here is exactly the, the, the converse of what you're suggesting we should do, which is um, let's look at why things are the way they are, and let's not just assume that this is a hard thing and that people will be uncomfortable. Because you know what, there's a hell of a lot of, of, of queer identified service members who are pretty uncomfortable. Um, there's a huge, uh, another thing I was really interested in your saying, which is really true, this is not the biggest problem the military has right now. I mean, the military has all sorts of PNR uh, personnel and, and readiness issues around suicide, around sexual assault, around budgeting. I mean, these are really, really big issues for the military right now. Um, and in so much as, as the, the, the issue of trans service, by the way, also intersects with those things, that's important considerations. I think what we would like is a fair, a fair analysis, um, a fair understanding, not based on old stereotypes, but, but a real good analysis. And, and I tell you, we will win that every time. Okay, let me uh, speed up a little bit the conversation and, and bring some questions that we are getting fr through Twitter. I will throw a couple um, to you to respond and, and pick and choose what, what you want to respond, but quickly, um, I want to build a little bit on what Monica and, um, and Chris uh, spoke. So there is a comparison 
um, of LGB inclusion in the military and transgender inclusion in the military. Are those two different things? Um, we have a Ryan asking here, um, do you think the reluctance to allow transgendered people to enlist is related to just the hetero norm, marriage laws in the, uni in the United States and, and such? So is it just the others uh, and that's what drives the conversation and that's why we're uncomfortable? Or is the LGB inclusion in the military somehow different from transgender inclusion? And if it is not different, why didn't we solve it with don't ask, don't tell, uh, when that issue was brought up and Congress was discussing that? And um, and following up on some of the discussions, we have a question here if sensitivity training is necessary for this. And so, in other words, maybe we should not jump right away into this. Maybe we should prepare and, and have readiness uh, of the soldiers to accept this. Um, maybe we'll do more harm, uh, switching quickly uh, to full inclusion than, than not. So. If you could address some of these questions and answer, Monica. I, uh, even though I want to see this happen, I'm not illusional to think, delusional I should say, to think that this is going to be an easy transition. And like Mara, I know that it'll happen, but it'll also happen when it's done right. It has to be done correctly. It has to be done uh, the way that it makes it a smooth transition, essentially like it did with the LGB people. It, they, it, the, if it's different, it, there is difference, but there is similarities. And, and people have, have even used the similarities of when Truman allowed uh, segregation in uh, 1947 for African American other people of color. Uh, people have used that as a similarity for gay, lesbian, bisexual, uh, but it's different. It's all these individual things are different and then they're the same. There's their parts of it are the same, but the parts that are not the same, that's the parts that we have to work on in order to ensure that trans people can smoothly be allowed to serve openly in the military. And that's the aspect, that's the discussion that we have not really seen too much happen yet. Testing. I just wanted to talk to you about actually how quickly attitudinal changes can take place. Uh, as I mentioned before, in the late 80s, we had a survey where 65% of the Canadian forces said that they would not serve with uh, an openly gay uh, soldier. But uh, so our policy to allow LGBTs into the Canadian forces changed in 92. We did a follow up survey in 93, just one year later, before we had introduced the sensitivity training, and the numbers switched almost exactly the opposite. So of 3,000 respondents, 43% said that they were very satisfied or satisfied with the new policy. Another 24%, they were neutral, and only 28 were dissatisfied. So that was a year after the change. So a huge change just by the introduction of the policy uh, before, again, the introduction of uh, sensitivity training that we call SHARP. So attitudes can change very quickly. No, no, you do it too. It's just a picture. Okay. Um, it, it, I think it's a, it's a it's an excellent question that that uh, that Ryan asked, and I would and I certainly defer to Monica and Mara on this, and 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 to the commander as well. Um, but one of the practical problems that is involved in in bringing the trans community into the military that is not necessarily involved in, in the lesbian and, and gay communities is the issue of medical health. Uh, the military, and people say, well, you're, you're, you discriminate against, against those that need uh, some, some uh, whatever the correct term is, to bring their, their physiology in line with their psychology. Um, the military doesn't, the U.S. military doesn't bring in people with pre-existing uh, pre medical conditions requiring uh, very dramatic 
action by the military medical system. And I think that's probably a little different than the Canadians. Um, it simply, you know, it won't bring in people with that they're going to need heart surgery. It won't bring in people in that that are going to require some major uh, gastroenterological work. It won't bring people in who have asthma conditions. It it it, it assumes that every soldier that comes in is fully medically capable of fulfilling uh, the missions that he or she is assigned without undergoing major surgical work. Um, so there is a there's a, there's a, a medical issue that's involved that differentiates to some extent between bringing between the lesbian gay community and and the the transgender community, um, and I would add quite in a separate vein back to the point that, that and you just said it in in how your soldiers responded. Soldiers will do whatever you ask them to do, and they'll make the best of it. Um, it goes back to the point that this is not going to be, it's not going to make or break the U.S. military. But because they are who they are, and because they respond the way they respond, we owe them a very special consideration as we implement changes in how they live. I, uh, uh, to answer a very specific question that was asked, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell could not consider the inclusion of tra or the allowance of trans people serving in the military because the don't ask, don't tell, don't uh, pursue policy did not prohibit trans uh, trans service. Trans service is prohibited in other ways um, in in the military. So there, I I think it's fair to say that the the Pentagon has not. Um, I mean, I'm not privy to all the conversations at the Pentagon. I don't know why. Um, but I think it's fair to say they, they haven't really given this uh, a fair amount of thought yet. Um, and, you know, our initial uh, overtures have been met with, ah, um, just a, you know, we've just done Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We're still doing Don't Ask, Don't Tell implementation, and we don't, we don't want to. Um, and it's, I don't think it's anything against trans people because they haven't gone that deep. But I, I also just... Um, want to note, I, I think part of the, one of the obstacles we have to overcome is this um, uh, sort of just assumption of medical disqualification because trans people may need some kind of surgery. Um, the, it's the number one question trans people get asked. It, you know, trans people say, I'm transgender, I'm transitioning, and people say, oh, when are you having the surgery? Okay, there's no such thing as the surgery. A lot of trans people never get it. Most of the people we're talking about here are not showing up in the military saying, make me a, a sergeant, give me some surgery. We are talking about people who, you know, more and more will have had surgery before they enter the military. Probably for the next, if, if, if the magic wand was waved today and we were allowed to serve, there probably would be a bunch of people currently in the military or who became in the military who would then seek access to those services. And, and I asked the, the, the commander doctor, which is like the best title I ever heard. Um, it, it, but there isn't a the surgery thing. I, I think we'd be very happy with a case-by-case -case analysis of that. There, there certainly are trans people who are medically unsit, unfit to be in the military. Um, but there are a heck of a lot of trans people for whom that's not a relevant question. Um, it, it, it isn't people showing up ready for surgery. Monica? Oh. See, it takes, it warms up. Uh, there's also other, you know, if you think about all the different aspects, parts of the transgender community, you know, we're not talking about just transsexuals. You know, transsexuals are the, are the individuals who would consider getting surgery if it was offered to them, but even not all transsexuals want to get surgery. And most male to female, or male, female to males, don't get surgery because it's uh, very expensive. So then there's the individuals who uh, on the weekend would go on liberty or take leave and, and they may dress up as, as a woman and then, you know, these individuals are treated exactly like any other trans person. Why is that? If this person is, is cross-dressing 
uh, at home or on leave someplace else away from the base, that person is not going to be seeking surgery. But then that person, if they get caught, will still get kicked out. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I would, you know, and if this was an issue that we could do this in increment, increment ways, then yeah, then maybe we could work on in increment ways of doing it, even though both Mar and I agree that we really wouldn't want to do increment, but you know, if this was the only way to get it done, we'd probably consider it. I do incremental. You do incremental what? Can you use the microphone? <laughs> Are we having fun with the mics tonight or what? Incrementalism is how things, are get, how things get done while people are complaining about incrementalism. So um, I want the, to open the floor for questions and, and um, invite the questions from the audience. Since um, we at Gettysburg College and uh, our primary purpose is to educate um, the students and give the opportunity for our um, young ones to uh, interact with the national leaders, I would like to invite the students first um, to ask the questions. We have two mics uh, on both sides of the room, so if you could um, go to the mic and ask the question. Um, they will be on, I think, and you will not need to deal with drama that apparently Mara and everyone else here has with microphones. Um, and while we have some students coming up, um, I, I want to follow with the um, commander. Did the surgery broke the budget uh, of the Canadian <coughs> Army? Was it very costly? Can, can we just leave yeah. our microphones on? Yeah, you can. Yeah. That's what I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the expert says yes. OK. It, the, some of the surgeries can be expensive, uh, uh, especially with the, um, the full up gender reassignment. Uh, they can run up to about 64000 But uh, in the scheme of things, we think that's a small price to pay to uh, provide equal access to care. And uh, we, cons we consider them a, a contributing member of our force. But they are, th I agree that it's on a continuum. And very few, uh, especially um, a female to male, actually go through the full surgery. So it, it's not as prevalent as you would imagine. And so we only have about one to two going through the full surgery a year. And so uh, it's on a full continuum, just from cross-dressing to uh, partial sur surgery to uh, full-up uh, sex reassignment. So, uh, and I just wanted to also emphasize that um, I'm not sure if it's because of the sensitivity training, but uh, um, the, the troops embrace that. They understand that uh, if for full reassignment surgery, the member has to have two psychiatric assessments, and then they cross-dress for a year before they get the definitive surgery. And uh, it's not an issue. People just accept it. They understand that people, uh, um, just to confirm that they need the surgery, they will be, uh, they'll be accommodated for the cross-dressing. And uh, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it just uh, it has not been a problem. Since we don't have students rushing to the microphones, if you are a student of life, you can also <laughs> ask the question. Hi again. So Dr. Shoemaker got me thinking a little bit, with my random notes here. Um, so I guess my question is sort of why is it uncomfortable for soldiers to be around trans people? Do you guys think that it's a reflection of society's primitive perspective on trans issues? And do you think that it's preventing open-mindedness by keeping trans people out of the military? Sorry, that's sort of three questions at once, but thoughts on that. Dr. Shoemaker, would you like to? Um, I don't know if, if you're much too young, but my, my son, who's about your age, his, his favorite movie that he's ever seen is a movie called Starship Troopers. I don't know if you've ever seen Starship Troopers. It's one of the most violent movies that you're ever going to see. But there's a scene where the soldiers, in fact, I guess they're Marines, they're ground Marines or something, are in basic training, and men and women, and they're all showering together. Um, 
Now, because it's Hollywood, there are a lot of gratuitous <coughs> scenes of focus on the women showering as opposed to the men, but that's neither here nor there. But it's a casual kind of thing, and nobody is saying, wow, 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 you know, let's, let's, let's go to it. That is, is probably the 30-year the solution, Mara, that trumps everything that goes before it. Um, we're not at the 30-year solution yet. And soldiers who, come, who tend to come from uh, more rural, more conservative backgrounds have an uncomfortable reaction when, and we talk about showers, because showers, believe it or not, are important in the military. I, I've gone a long time without a shower, and I can tell you, when you finally get that shower, and it, you know, Bill, Bill Matz knows very well, too, it's, it's, it's like God's gift. Um, so there is a level of discomfort in showering with, with members of the opposite sex, um, whether that's a, 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 um, a trans woman or a trans man. Um, much less discomfort in showering with members of the same sex. This sounds almost insultingly basic, um, but it's true. And as we look at comfort levels, that's, again, it's not going to bring down the empire, but it's something that, that we really need to consider as we look at changes to that kind of basic level of comfort that we can sometimes offer our soldiers. Now, it's interesting that uh, talk about closeness and showers and everything. And just last year, the uh, military allowed women to serve on submarines. They started off with officers, but uh, soon they will have enlisted uh, women on board as well. But then uh, the doctor here, he said that women have been serving on diesel boats. We're not talking <coughs> nuclear submarines. We're talking diesel boats in the Canadian Navy for 30 years. Now, if you've ever seen a diesel boat, you know that these things are tinier than heck. So this issue about showering, I mean, this thing has been, is, is long since passed. Uh, yes, the women on submarines in the American, uh, it's, they are segregated for their own space and all, but still, you know, it's, it definitely is going to happen. And uh, yes, it may take 30 years for, a footnote for Monica, who's, and, she, and she'll have to agree to this, because she's a submariner. Submariners are a weird bunch. <laughs> Their brains are irradiated, I think, by the nuclear piles. And I was, tra I was trained in nuclear power, so, you I, was, see? so I worked back in the engine room. <coughs> so I tell people, this is what happens. <laughs> Do we have other students uh, who would like to ask a question? And I know that we have some students visiting us from New York and Dickinson College. We welcome all of you here today. And you feel free to ask questions here as well. Um, hello. Um, this question is for Shoemaker. Um, my question was, you said something about them um, troops feeling uncomfortable. You made a reference about your son. So my thing is, don't you feel the lack of knowledge provided to these conservative folks can damage their perception of things? Yeah, that, uh, let me start my answer by an apology. Uh -huh. um, you know, when I was 17 years old, and I know it's hard to believe I was ever 17, but I was back in the Civil War, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, I went off to West Point. My father, who was a, um, a stern and patrician general, took me aside and said, son, I have three pieces of advice to offer you before you go off to join the world of men. One, never invade Russia in the wintertime. <laughs> Two, never look down in a chemical latrine. And three, never apologize for nothing. So I have to break that third by apologize and say, I, I'm an old field artilleryman and I can't hear very well. Okay. So could you please repeat your question? Um. <laughs> That's a way to eat up a few minutes, huh? Hello. All right. So my question was, don't you feel the lack of knowledge provided to these conservative folks can damage their perception of things like, 
you know, going into um, war with someone that's trans or gay. Um, you know, I feel like sometimes, personally, if you're educated about these things, you won't really have sort of like a negative perception of, you know, instances like this. So what is your answer to that? Like, Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Okay. And I, I did hear it that time. Okay. Uh, it goes back to the point of sensitivity training, but it also goes back to the point of incrementalism. And one of the things I wanted to, to ask both Mara and Monica about, uh, since I've got their expertise right here, <clears throat> it seems to me that part of the challenge that the, the transgender community confronts, that the gay and lesbian communities do not confront, is the very definition uh, and the broad spectrum of of uh, behaviors and people that are covered under the general umbrella of trans, of, of a transgender. Um, the issue is if, 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 if you walk into a shower mm -hmm. and you say, how many know what a gay is? Okay, how many know what lesbians are? Yes, how many know what bisexuals are? Well, the number goes down. How many know anything about transgenders? What, aren't, aren't they the ones that grow their hair long? Well, transgender covers, as I'm now learning, a wide variety, uh, all the way from you know, sort of off-base, cross-dressing kind of thing to full-out transsexual uh, uh, gender reassignment. So part of the challenge, it seems to me, goes back to the education issue and the incrementalism issue, to be able to, to sub-differentiate um, transgenders into, into at least m more comprehensible sub-organizations or sub-orientations. Uh, now, does that make sense or is this... Uh you know, it, 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 I, I, I do understand that and I do understand there's um, lack of understanding um, and, and misunderstanding. But, you know, the military, uh, the U.S. military, and I assume all militaries, um, exclude types of people, right? You may say, we won't take anybody up, uh, take, take anybody in who has a particular kind of psychosis, or maybe who uh, has uh, missing limbs or a certain number of missing limbs or something. You can't join the military. And they will take types of people and they will say no. And in fact, there's no type of people who is absolutely allowed in without exception, right? So, you know, white people, just because they're white people or white men who have always been allowed to serve are not absolutely allowed to serve just because they're white people. Um, uh, or, or white men or men aren't allowed or people who are 5'10 aren't, you know, automatically included. We do have these automatic exclusions, though, that, that ought to be based on something, right? There, there is a reason why um, you know, meth, uh, an active meth addict might not be an appropriate person to have in a submarine, <laughs> right? But, well... Don't use submarines as your example now. No, no, it probably well, I, works in a submarine, I don't no, know. No, no, and I, am not, I, I don't mean to disrespect at all anybody who's having a substance abuse problem, but um, transgender people, th there is no basis other than what my friend Paris was talking about here, um, other than lack of understanding, that trans people are one of those categories that is just automatically excluded. There, there isn't really a medical reason for it. There isn't really a good order and, what's the other part of that thing? Good order and discipline um, reason for it. There are these perceptions, just as, there, there's an interesting book I was just reading about, about the, um, the dissipation of power in the country, it's not just changing from um, from men to shifting from men to women and shifting geographically. It's also becoming harder and harder to use power. And one of the reasons that that's happening is that um, centers of power and centers of authority have been forever misusing their power and and making some of their power choices arbitrarily. And now those are a lot more visible than they used to. Right? It wouldn't have been so easy to point at the military and saying, yeah, we've heard this before, as Monica went through the litany. This, 
oh my gosh, if we let black people serve, it'll be the end of the world and white people will feel uncomfortable. Um, and, and women, and, and we've, we've been able to see that whole parade and, and it takes away from the moral authority um, when we look at yet another category of people who are just arbitrarily, categorically excluded um, without scientific basis, without moral basis, um, just because we always sort of have, and I think they're icky. Let, let me give an opportunity to... Let me just respond briefly okay. to that, because it's a very good point. Um, but I, I think that, that the, the advocacy community um, needs to, to pause just a little bit and consider whether or not your rather strong statements, most of which actually I, I agree with if you substitute out military, um, do apply to the military. Because um, you made some pretty strong statements there and, and what I'm asking is that, that the advocacy community really think those things through and, and do more than simply say, well, in society in general, X, Y, or Z, but live and breathe in a military environment to be able to better understand that things you said really aren't absolute. That, that there's you know, the no evidence and that's perfectly okay and that was another long line, a parade of, it, those are a little strident and probably ought to, um, ought to take a look once again in, in uh, you know, walk a mile in their boots. My daughter says, if I walk a mile in your shoes, then I'm a mile away and I have your shoes. Um, I don't know whether that makes sense to her or not, but it, it, it's probably not a bad idea while you're, while you're correctly urging the institutions of, of our nation to look at these issues from an inclusive human rights perspective. Probably ought a, good, a, a good idea also to appreciate what the institution feels and believes where it lives and works. Jenny on Twitter says, if we trust soldiers with guns, military secrets, and the lives of others, why can't we trust them to figure out a shower schedule or <laughs> some of these other things? And if you have other questions, that's feel free to come to the That's a self-explanatory one. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, first I just want to say my name is Scoop from Youth Advisory Board at the Hetrick Martin Institute in New York. And just a few things, like I don't really have a question, but just a few comments. Uh, the gentleman on the end, you mentioned the comfort of o other soldiers, so it's seems like you're implying that it's okay to discriminate for the comfort of other people. And you also mentioned the medical issues about it, and you said something about psychological, but being transgender is not a mental disorder. So that, to me, should just be thrown out right there. And also, there was one more thing. Um, oh, you said something about the tax dollars, like, People, Americans pay tax dollars to support the military and the things that they need to protect this country. Transgender people aren't excluded from paying taxes either. So, and the thing about the showers, if a transsexual person go into a shower, like if I was a transsexual female to male and I go into a male shower, I'm also a male, so what is the problem? Anyone want care to comment to that? Uh, or no, no, just give it up. Okay, go go for it. Uh, I, I guess hi, I'm Lee. I'm from Gettysburg. But um, kind of my question is: is uh, you met actually? I, I guess we're kind of always talking to you, uh, Dr. Shoemaker. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, we're always talking to you, Dr. Shoemaker. But you actually uh, mentioned kind of earlier. Um, with your kind of first statement that kind of the role of the American military today and it's to win the wars that we are fighting currently. And I kind of almost want to say, I kind of want to ask, because I think a lot of times we're talking about the negative aspects of um, transsexuals joining the military, be accepting, being accepted in the military. But I think in a lot of ways, the wars we fight today 
are very much different from the wars we fought in the past. In a lot of ways, you know, the war that we're fighting in Afghanistan is about eliminating military targets, but it is still about winning a population, convincing a population that our form of democracy works, that our, form, that our system works. And in some ways, you know, soldiers have to learn understanding. And that's been a huge process of, Af of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and any future war we fight in the Middle East is us learning understanding about the countries we wage war in. So wouldn't kind of um, a more greater inclusion in the military kind of a great, it would not only send kind of a message, but it would also kind of allow for soldiers to kind of have more open, be more open, not to just to different sexualities and different sexual preferences, but also to uh, different cultures and different kind of religious backgrounds. Wasn't, wouldn't it kind of be a, pro, a, a general process of expanding of kind of acceptance that we need if we're gonna win wars where we have to convince the minds of the people that were, of the territories we fight in? While the green light will turn on, I'll ask the gentleman here who was waiting for a long time uh, to ask you a question since- well, let, me, let me come, I'll have the opportunity to come back to your question. Because some of these so, were more comments than questions, but yeah. and then we can Dr. Uh, Shoemaker, address. is this on now? Yeah. Dr. Shoemaker, if anybody's attacking you and it seems like I'm attacking you, believe me. Um, anyway, my question is that um, we're, you're so concerned about the uh, soldier, the comfort of the soldiers. A report in NPR this morning said that 25 percent, one in four women in the American military are raped every year, and some more than once. So here we have a situation where this is the military, and we're concerned about them, and you have a, uh, and you talk about the, their uh, morale and what goes on, and here you have a problem that's serious, and this seems almost minor compared to that. You know, we're talking about a huge segment of the military is being, as you said, harassed, and yet we're talking about how many transsexuals want to get into the military, but we're concerned about you know, the, the, uh, the feelings, the comfort level of our military, it just seems to me it doesn't, it's a, it's a non-issue when you compare it to a much larger issue. I'm, I'm not, f f I didn't see the NPR report. I would, I would be astounded if it's one in, in, in four. However, your point is, is well taken. Um, the military, and I, it, part of it comes back to the question that, that you asked. And I, in fact, I had this conversation with, uh, with uh, General Matz, and I think he's, he raised a very good perspective. Um, consider a young 22-year-old field artillery platoon leader who's responsible, you know, two years out of college, he's now responsible for the lives of 30 Americans, his, his platoon. And he's operating perhaps in Afghanistan in an environment that's different than than um, a large-scale force-on-force combat operation. He's got a lot going on. He's trying to figure out how to deal with a village uh, chieftain who, uh, a village chief who wants a well dug. Now, he doesn't know anything about digging wells. Um, or a school rebuilt. Now, he can kind of think his way through that one. Um, at the same time, he's now got to grapple with the issues of, of five of his, of his soldiers are, are now women. How does he make sure that they're not sexually harassed? How does he make sure that, that they are able to be all they can be in that environment? He's grappling with a whole range of issues, and this is kind of up close and personal, including the shower schedule. Um, we have to be careful as we go through the, the issues, such as we're discussing tonight, that we don't put those young leaders into overload, where they simply can't handle more change and more pressure on them. Now, that's not to say that, that status quo stays forever, three or, th three or 30. Yeah. But it is to say that, that when we consider an issue like, like uh, transgenders, and I, th I think the number in the Canadian Army is very small, I would suspect the relative number in the military would also, and the U.S. military would be small as well. We have to consider the context in which we're asking that young platoon leader to operate. You, you um, forgot an important point you, you, uh, about that platoon leader, because I want to help you out here, because you forgot to mention that that platoon leader, with all of that stuff he's dealing with, 
in his heart and in his mind, he knows he's trans. And he knows he, he wants to be a woman, and he's like, can I stay in the military? What happens if I get caught? Am I gonna have to pay back my West Point tuition if somebody finds out I'm trans? And yeah, I wanna protect the women in my platoon, and I wanna protect the men who might get sexually assaulted. But you know what? I've got this thing about me that is just about me. It's in my head, and it's something I think about every day about my gender. And I, I really wanna be a military officer for my whole career, and you know what? if anybody finds out my secret, or if I have to hold this secret inside for all of this time, am I operating fully e effectively? That's the transgender person we're talking about. I, I, I would take an issue with that, because I, I would suspect that transgender or straight, that individual is first a, an officer, and he or she is not thinking about oh, whether yes or not he's are. transgender if he's in combat. Oh, he's yes thinking, no, are. he's not. He's thinking about oh, how yes, he how he can are. keep his how he can accomplish his mission and keep his people alive. Now, when he gets when he gets back to the shower after the mission's over, sure that that may emerge. And but and, you, and I wasn't an officer in the military, but I know enough about it to know that if you can't multitask, you can't be an officer. Commander Wilcox. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to comment on the shower issue. Again, we have 20 years of experience, and it is not a problem. We provide individual showers for men that feel uncomfortable, both, both their body as women and transgenders and bisexuals. So we don't force everybody to have group showers. It's, group showers are available, but individual showers are available as well so that, you know, uh, it, it hasn't been an issue. And we have... Um, LGBTs in all rank structures. We've had two Surgeon Generals that were lesbians. We've had, in our headquarters, they, we have uh, LGBTs. So it hasn't been an issue. Uh, so I, I, I did want to correct that thing where I said we don't accommodate them. Um, I meant more in sleeping and our bunking arrangements, but uh, they, you do, we do not force uh, people to have group showers that feel uncomfortable. We do provide individual showers wherever they are. If it's in the field, they can have Jerry Cran Jerry can showers if there's other showers available. So showering has not been an issue. Okay. Can you, could you please use the microphone because people cannot hear. This is an excellent, I'm absolutely fascinated by, by how you all are doing it. Because when you're in combat, you don't have showers. You're sponge bathing. You're sponge bathing and you're defecating in front of people and you're urinating in front of people. And all of that going on, you're trying to think of how am I going to fix my bayonet and shove it into somebody? It's totally different combat than what we're talking about right now. You know, the, the sense that, y you know, am I having to think about my, sec my, my sexual, am I a male or female in combat? God almighty, is that just so, f to me to think about that, I wasn't in combat, thank God. I trained enough, and I know some of the things that might be going on, but, you know, you're... You're so focused on trying to accomplish the mission. And what is that? It's killing people. It's about killing and annihilating or defending, but at the same time killing. When the shrapnel is flying around, when the cordite is being smelt, the whole thing. And what is fascinating is what about when, you know, we've got those units, those Marine Corps units, those Army infantry units, small, you know, when in accomplishing the mission, when you've got these potential distracting factors. What happens? That's what I'm really fascinated about learning right now. Thank you. you, you what you just said was, when somebody is that focused on their mission, they cannot possibly think about their identity, but they sure as hell can worry about the other guy's identity? That doesn't make any sense to me. No, not the enemy, the identity. Your, what we've heard over and over again is, uh, or, I'm sorry, not over and over again. What we just heard was, and, and I just picked that platoon leader because we were talking about a platoon leader as if that person could not possibly be trans. And then what I heard was, he's a platoon leader, he's in combat, so he cannot possibly worry about his identity. Yet, he now has a distraction of somebody else's identity, which is going to be distracting to him. I don't understand that. I think, I think that probably mixes a little bit of apples and oranges. My point was that you've got a young platoon leader out there who is, now in combat, he's not worried about anything except, as you indicate, how to accomplish the mission and keep his troops alive. But combat is, is uh, the close fight is a snapshot in a much broader um, 
panorama of his activities in a combat zone where he's training, he's arming, he's preparing, um, and his focus is as intense, if not a little broader. And my point is, as we look at the range of now changes that are occurring that he has to grapple with, and you know, showers, I appreciate the Canadian ability to do that. Uh, and, and the military, unless you're, unless you're in a close fight, US military also showers in the field. Sometimes they're, in fact, we call them Australian showers, as you probably know. Um, he's got to grapple with those kinds of issues. And he's got to grapple with now a range of, of, um, of social related issues that come to him all at once. So let's not overload that, that young platoon leader. He's got, he's got enough on his plate right now. Let's go, and you said it, and, and uh, Monica said it, let's go incrementally. Let me, um, so maybe we can move away from some shower questions uh, <laughs> for a while. But it seems like Canadians figured it out. It could be done, it could be solved. A lot of these issues, I think, just talking about it, we see how things could be fixed. We have three people that are standing at the microphone for quite a while. I want to give you an opportunity to ask your question. Um, so not comments, but questions. And uh, that will be the last from the floor. And then we will wrap up. We are a little bit over time. Uh, but I want you to give you an opportunity to present. And I guess I you are getting koozies for your questions as well. He was standing longer than I was, I think. So yeah. all of you, please ask your questions. And then the, the panelists will answer. All right, so my, uh, hi, my name's David. I'm a student here at Gettysburg College. Uh, my question uh, goes to the difference between um, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and then what would be a change in the transgender policy. Um, you kind of alluded to the fact that uh, transgenders are uh, excluded from the military based on military policy as opposed to congressional policy. Um, so then I guess my question is how do those of us in the civilian sphere affect change in this area given the fact that it's, it, the change, I guess, needs to come from the military institution itself? Is there things that we can do to get the military ready to take this change on their own, since we are somewhat limited in what we can do from the civilian sphere? Please ask your questions. Oh, well, it's um, a different question in tone. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Monica and the commander and the colonel for their service. And I wanted to thank Mara for your advocacy on, on behalf of trans people like me. But uh, my question is actually directed to the commander or, um, well, I don't know how this works, how this could feasibly work in uh, if the Army or the Armed Forces, American Armed Forces, um, allowed trans people to serve openly. But I was wondering, since, well, I'm an aspiring rabbinical student, and so all questions, spiritual, are, are of interest to me. So I was wondering how or what kind of pastoral care uh, is in place for LGBT uh, soldiers in the Canadian Forces. And then the last question. Just really quickly, uh, and if it matters, I'm speaking as a former military officer, former military enlisted person, and a military sociologist. And I have to get into the larger cultural context here. The military is a, a group of young people primarily. So as we see cultural attitudes change in the larger society, do you think that they, uh, that cohort, young cohort, will bring those into the military? Uh, the other part of that is, I think that uh, DSM-4 and maybe the DSM-5, if we've got that yet, still classifies gender identity disorder as a disorder? No. DSM-5, no. DSM-5 does not. Okay, great. Because when um, homosexuality was declassified as a mental uh, or a psychological disorder, I think that probably set the stage for these things. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to point out, um, and uh, speaking to the last uh, question, the Episcopal Church has just now allowed transgendered uh, persons to become priests, so that might be a part of, of, of that uh, conversation. But I, I did want to say that military policy, as is in any large institution, is not necessarily made according to rational and scientific data, okay? And, um, a lot of these questions are not can questions. Can transgendered persons serve in the military? Of course they can. Of course they have the ability. But they're should questions. Should this be permitted? So that's, that's a different kind of conversation uh, that you, you bring and you bring in different um, 
you, you bring in ethical uh, questions, you bring in moral questions. So it's a different kind of, of uh, evidence or body of proof that might be brought into the conversation. Thank you. So we have these two important uh, angles. Uh, so what does the society have, does society have a role in this con kind of conversation? And I will add to, to that, do colleges and universities, uh, do students and colleges and universities have a role in this conversation? We know with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, they did, and, and colleges took stances. Now we have transgender inclusion military. Um, do we see it differently um, playing out? Uh, and then the religious uh, and spiritual services to the transgender individuals. So I'll give Commander uh, Wilcox first word, and then if everyone could keep their answers to a minimum. Yeah, I just w I'll just say we quickly, uh, they are, um, it's unfortunate we can't go through the actual policies, but uh, written in the policy is extensive pastoral, extensive pastoral involvement, and um, I wasn't sure if that was your question or w whether transgenders can go into pastoral care. They uh, they can. They, uh, in fact, uh, we are prohibited of uh, on the uh, recruit side uh, on the enrollment of asking what their sexual orientation is, so they can uh, they can enter and do whatever they want in the CF. But uh, if there is uh, if they do suffer from gender dysphoria and there are some issues, uh, written into the policy is extensive pastoral care. Um, on changing the the, uh, the regulation, and it is a regulation, is actually quite simple. Uh, unlike uh, Don, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was a law, um, the commander in chief of the armed forces can change anything he wants to change within that's that's within the purview of the military. So, if President Obama wanted to change it tomorrow, he could change it tomorrow. I don't suggest he do so, but that's uh, that was an easy solution an easy uh, process for him. Monica or Mara, do you have last comments? Well, I, yeah, I'll just say thank you, everybody. Um, I, I've learned a lot, too. And, and uh, to, I'll, I guess my last comments will be an answer to the, the question from this side of the room, which is what can people be doing? You know, I think this conversation is really just beginning. Um, most folks in the transgender part of the LGBT movement um, purposely let the don't ask, don't tell train go by first because we knew we couldn't get attention on this issue. Um, we are now, I think, just all starting to gear up on this. Um, I, you know, and I, I think you're right about what kind of evidence is needed, but I, I'm a much more practical person, and, and there are just times I just, I, I just want to, I want to go up to my colleagues in the Pentagon and say, you know, it's going to happen. How do we do it? Because it is going to happen. Um, and, it's, and it's really just a question about how, and I want to do it in the way that is best for um, the defense of the country and is best for the people in the military, trans or otherwise. Um, but, but I want to get to that, and I, I don't want to have to go through all sorts of nonsensical arguments that we've heard a million times before uh, that, 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 aren't, that aren't relevant to it. You know, it's, this is how it is going to be. And, and, and let's get to that. And then I think the, the, the other thing that people really ought to be doing, and I, and I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't bring this up now, is we are seeing more and more evidence all the time that the American people just let the civilian leaders of the military um, in, in the White House um, do some really incredibly immoral, stupid, um, unsafe, um, remarkably incompetent and venal things with our military that they never should have been allowed to do. And I, I'm talking about the two wars that one of which we certainly did not need to fight and, and maybe we did need to fight in Afghanistan. But, but every single one of us in this country let the Iraq war happen. And if you want to help veterans, stop making veterans in unjust wars. If you want to help people in the military, don't send them to unjust wars. Uh, I, I don't think I'm ready to say that the Afghanistan war was an unjust war, but I certainly am willing to say that about the Iraq war. And I let it happen, and everybody who's an American let it happen. We just let our civilian leadership just play with our military in stupid, dangerous, immoral ways. Monica, would you like to close I, uh, the, the I discussion? I just want to say thank everyone here. 
and everyone on the panel for for their uh, participation. Uh, this this is not an issue that's going to happen tomorrow, uh, but if it happens, play other places. If uh, the Australians and the New Zealands, New Zealanders, and the Polish, and the Spanish, and the uh, Czech Republic. I mean, come on, people. The Israelis, of course, everybody in there in Israel has to serve, so it's like, okay, but. <laughs> It happens every. It happens in these countries, and and to say that the Israelis don't are not strong in their military, <coughs> come on, give me a break. Uh, and to say that, uh, I mean, you know, we got countries that can do this. We, we got a we got a a prince who serves right next to a transsexual, who's who one day will be king of England. I mean, it's it's ridiculous to say that we're not able to do this when it's been proven that we can and we've been all throughout history we've been doing this it's just that we didn't tell anybody i sure in heck didn't want to tell anybody of course back in 1970 i didn't quite know what i was anyway so <laughs> but still it's it's something that sh that will happen as mar says and I want to see it happen before I pass away. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And it seems that we do agree that it's going to happen one day or the other, just when, three years or 30 years from now, and how. So I think this conversation is a start. Um, of how that could could be done and, and what needs to be done. Um, this conversation is also the beginning of the Allies Week or Trans Awareness Week here at Gettysburg College. The rainbow flag that flies currently over Cupola signifies that week. So I encourage you all to participate in all those other events on campus during the next week. And now I would like to invite everyone to give a great applause to our panelists who joined this conversation today. Thank you.